It is no secret that nostalgia has been big business for video game developers. Both AAA and indie devs have taken full advantage of our desire and joy regarding the games of old. Recent games like Shovel Knight, Undertale, and Axiom Verge, possibly evoking memories of perhaps Mega Man, Earthbound, and Metroid, respectively. Nintendo, with Donkey Kong Country Returns and Kirby's Return to Dreamland, for additional examples. But underneath all of this lies a debate which you can easily find on many video game message boards. Is all this nostalgia holding video games back? You'll find points and counterpoints made on both sides of this, but on today's episode, we're going to look at predominantly why some think nostalgia might be stifling the medium, and whether we feel that such criticism is actually warranted. Listen in, next, on Downloadable Content. Welcome to Downloadable Content. I'm Brian, and with me we have Ron. Hey, everyone. And we have Ronnie. Welcome back. Greetings. Good to be here. All right. It's 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 the Ron and Ronnie show again. Got to get our fusion dance on. Yeah, yeah you, we <laughs> got to do this at least once a season. Yeah, you have to do this. It's a giant woman. Uh, it's, it's a two-pronged Ron attack. So that's what you'll get on this episode. First appearance for Ronnie in Season 7, so welcome back. It hasn't been too long. Uh, y- y- you're correct. Um, I'm glad to be able to make my one season appearance, you know? Well, it's like Joshy. You know, he has to make his, his one appearance per year from England, and that's usually around the E3 episode, so. <laughs> but yes, we'll be talking about nostalgia in the video game industry and all that, but before we dive in... Just want to remind everyone out there that every single episode of downloadable content can be found on our website, www.dlcpodcast.com. You can also check out the schedule for upcoming episodes and use the feedback button to give us questions, ideas, comments, or even if you want to be on an episode. Just let us know. All there, dlcpodcast.com. Alrighty, gentlemen. So let's dive into today's topic, in which we talk about nostalgia, which is something that we talk about a lot here on Downloadable Content. As you know, we've, we do mm-hmm. a fair amount of anniversary episodes, and we just did a marathon for Final Fantasy VII as that hit its 20th anniversary, uh, making fun of it and loving it at the same time. Yeah, if there was no nostalgia, I don't know if there would be a downloadable content. You know, that's that's the thing. It's we're we're in that era now, especially with the us, you know, us in this episode, you know, getting into our our thirties and such. So having grown up on mm-hmm. Nintendo and Super Nintendo and Sega, seeing all these franchises which are still going, hitting their twenty, twenty fifth, or thirty year milestones. So we're we're. Oh. Sorry, we're in we're we're in that uh, that period of time where I'm able to do a bunch of these these episodes. I suppose one way that would be good for us to start is if we each said what we think of as nostalgia in video games. Like, what does that mean to each of us, so we know where each of us is arguing from? All right, I guess for me. Um, looking at what I perceive as the current big boom in nostalgia. I'm talking about games that have the look, feel, and sound of NES, Super Nintendo games, Sega Genesis games. Um, For me, I guess nostalgia would be 
I kind of going off of what Brian said a bit about like the look and soundtrack of the of the games, but also um, like a general feeling of simpler gameplay. I guess would be the the, the word I'm looking for, where it's like. One button does attacks. One button does jumping. One button does opens huh? up the map and things like that. And it's not like intricate combos of action shooting and leaping okay. over ledges and things like that. Where it's um, so it's nostalgia as it relates to gameplay. Yeah. Okay. I I wouldn't even have thought of that. Actually, that's actually really cool. Um. I guess for me, nostalgia at its core is comfort. Um, it's the stuff we grew up with, the stuff we are comfortable around, stuff we relate to. Um, as a culture and people, we communicate very much by referencing old things to describe newer things. And I feel like nostalgia is an outgrowth of that. Um, it's the reason why when a new video game comes out, even if it's unrelated to it, we'll call it a Metroidvania game because it's that style of game. Do you, you get what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, there are, there are, there's a mindset amongst gamers which, you know, has been more prevalent than I thought it was because, you know, seeing all of this this wave of games that have the look and feel you know the pixel graphics the chip tune sound you know the sort of simplistic gameplay you know we saw we see a lot of that you know in the indie side of game development predominantly but you know not, not really as much with the AAA titles what we what we tend to see there are a lot of sequels and remakes and ports. Cash-ins. Yeah, and, you know, easy money. And for a lot of, for, well, a considerable number of gamers, this is, they feel that this is not really good to just, you know, for the industry to just rest on its laurels like this and not create new franchises, new IPs, and new visions for for future games. Well, one thing I think uh, is part of this discussion that might be good to, if not if not uh, separate, but at least reference that, I, th I feel like there's a big difference between what I'll call roster update sequels and actual sequels and nostalgia, where roster update sequels to me are a lot of sports titles, not all, um, or a lot of first-person shooters where it's a sequel with very little additional content where it's it's basically annually we put this thing out so you can have the new names on your game and that's basically it i'll also add to that list fighting games can yeah. have a similar thing too especially the current street fighter holy dear god street fighter is terrible for that right now where it's like oh we're just gonna add one character every two or three months and not change the underlying problems with our game right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think, because I, I, I know I'm going to be arguing for nostalgia through a lot of this, but I, I want to say I'm not de going to defend these the roster update games. Those, I think, universally we can say are not a positive to the industry, except in the course of if the company uses that to fund a more innovative game. In theory, which yes. yeah, in, in theory, yes. In actuality, most of them are just a cash grab, like EA's pumping out of the well sports libraries. I mean, most video game companies are not making oodles of money, and every success they have is what allows them to make another title that they can't bank on. And by a non-bankable title, I don't even just mean a new, innovative IP. I'm meaning bringing back an IP that maybe hasn't been around for a while that they can't guarantee is going to print money. Mm -hmm. So, before we started recording, I had read and had uh, Ron and Ronnie read an article that basically was the inspiration 
for this episode. It was an article written in the Atlantic, dated... Um, when, hmm? Which by itself is funny to see, just an article on video games in the Atlantic. Yeah, but I saw that and I gave it a... a, a a good a read and that's that's what triggered this so hopefully both of you read this article absolutely yeah i did and you know it brings up a, a few good points i mean th it talks about that how you have the danger of nostalgia becoming little more than just a simple marketing tool and you know, to some extent, I happen to agree with that sentiment because when I see Capcom putting out Resident Evil 4 for the ninth time, it I, I do feel just a tiny bit peeved. It's like, okay, how many versions can you shove onto people? Well, is that different versions or is that ports because with Resident Evil 4 I'm pretty sure those are just ports. They, they are, they're straight ports. It, it's not it's not like Resident Evil 1 which has had three or four different versions at this point. Yeah, you... cuz port cuz ports are more just like you don't have the older system anymore so now you so now you want to pick it up and be able to play it again. Like I I think ports are just kind of universally just a good thing cuz all you're doing is just opening it up to people with different consoles. Like, there's no development that goes into that. It, the, the, go on, Ron. One second. You can continue on that. You need to wait for a second. Oh, all right. Um, it's you know what? It, it's just when I saw the advertisement from Capcom, you know, mm -hmm. saying you can now pre-order Resident Evil Four for PlayStation Four and Xbox One. Yeah, the the what I think we're going to see them going away from it, and I won't even say think, because a bunch of companies already are, is now that we are, are, are more into the digital marketplace, we're going to see a lot more direct ports that aren't going to be taking up retail space. And in that case, I really don't see any negative to it. I can see a negative for the ones that are taking up retail space in Walmart or in, in you know in GameStop and any of the video game stores because there's only so much space for each system um, and those are taking up new release spots that could be used for something more innovative but if all you're doing is porting the game over and people who want it can just find it on the digital marketplace like I think those are just positives overall and welcome back Ron thanks if, if, on, the, on, on the other hand though you have issues with people like Capcom charging 20, 30 bucks for these ports when I could literally go into a GameStop and or go online and buy the game itself for the original console or one of the other console ports that they release for like ten dollars, if that. Yeah, that's and like the... sorry, and, it, and just and it's just like sure having it available is fine, but there's a difference between having it be available and then charging more than the game would probably be worth for similar titles like it, it it's a it's for for some people that they're smart about it and they have it be oh it's just like ten dollars or something like this for this port because it's like we get it like it's a port you just you just want to have it available to play again whenever you want versus people like Capcom who are just like, oh, we're going to charge $30 for this game that you love because, well, we need the money and screw our fan base. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll agree with that. I think video games, and I know this is going to come up later in the article, I think the cost of video games is going to be very much changing as we go forward and is going to be changing what kind of games are going to get made more than anything else going forward because with the rise of cheap titles on Steam that are still good titles or on mobile systems um, cell phones I and the people who grew up with these that don't necessarily think that all games are worth a $60 price tag I think we're going to be seeing a lot of changes to that and I think ports that they lower the price on I think for most companies are going to be something we're going to be seeing shortly yeah 
I also I also think that you know the recent recession had a major role to play in this sort of sentiment, this sort of mindset, because I, I it seemed to me that a lot of video game developers. Uh, particularly on the major consoles, really, really played it safe. They did not want to take any sort of risk at all on a new IP. So we just got sequel after sequel after sequel. I I don't even think it was a recession, personally. I think it was an actual depression. Just they didn't they don't want to say the D word. They definitely did not want to say the D word, and it definitely was a depression. So yeah. In any event, uh, I, I, and, but yes, I, I agree with you. Basically, from hey, I, I will say, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, probably to twenty fifteen. Would that be a, a, a good enough mm-hmm. time frame? You think that yeah. make, that makes sense? Yeah, yeah, like like pretty much like for almost all the the Xbox three hundred and sixty and the PS three lifespan was a little yeah. more than sequelitis, and I. Brian, my memory might be old, so you may need to correct me on this. All right, correct. wasn't I complaining about sequelitis in 2012 when like the first season of downloadable content? I think I've been complaining about it right along. I mean, we've been doing. Well, <laughs> well it's, I suppose one thing I'll bring up because I, I actually was going to bring this up as part of it is: can you guys tell me a point in time where video games weren't dominated by sequels? Because even in the NES's lifespan, franchises started as soon as there was a game that was released that did a decent amount, and then they would start sequels to it. I, and the Super Nintendo was dominated by sequels, and like every every system that isn't new gets dominated uh, okay. by franchises. So, so to and I want to say counteract your point, but to like argue against it. Yeah, that is called the counterpoint. Whatever. <laughs> point counterpoint. Um, so, like, because for the NES and the SNES and Genesis, like, eras, basically, and even into the PlayStation 1 and, and Nintendo 64 era, I would argue this too, is cost of gaming in terms of making a game was not nearly as expensive as it is right now. Way cheaper. Absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, to be fair, part of that is just money and and, and the, the the inflation of money and dollars back then actually went for more than they than they do today and, com- and companies back then like video game companies now it costs millions to make games but they have millions now back then yeah. nobody was giving a video game company millions to make this this is new yeah yeah like I mean like unless unless you're an actual dedicated video game company like Squaresoft was like most of you, prob- most of the game companies in Japan probably had, um, like their money be also being in pachinko machines yep. or, or slot machines or something like that. Like, and, I mean, hell, Konami see- still does that. Where they're making pachinko machines and they're somehow converting their, yep. like, they're focusing away from video gaming and back to the pachinko machines because they're not making any money with their titles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and not just because they're not making money with their titles, that's the company making a decision. I won't even go into Konami. If we go into Konami, I'm not going to stop. I mean, to be fair, <laughs> Konami is like probably the, the one company that's doing more dumb bullshit than Capcom. So. Yes. But uh, I, I, would, I would agree with everything you said there. Like, they didn't need as much money to be able to justify this idea that might not that might not work but i mean yeah as you, you mentioned squaresoft i mean squaresoft al- almost went out of business because they they were making games and they just couldn't couldn't make a hit until final fantasy yeah. well part of the thing too was also that square was squaresoft was making games for pc mostly and it, i i don't know about you but i would argue that pc gaming really really until doom was pretty piss poor and even after Doom, it was still a, a, quite a while before people started realizing, oh, we can just make these games that are on a console for a PC too. It, it didn't. It, it, I will agree with you. It didn't hit the mainstream until Doom. Um, 
I'm a PC gamer who doesn't play first person shooters, so Doom was not my introduction to PC gaming. I, I understand that. I just, uh, I mean, Doom is the is the mainstream example, yeah. I guess. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And even even games that were before Doom that got attention, a lot of the times they didn't get attention until Doom happened. People realized PC gaming, and then they learned about earlier stuff. Yeah, and and so like, sure, Square was probably making some money with some of their PC gaming, but like, I mean, that's part of the reason why they were gonna just do Final Fantasy and be done with it because like, it was they were basically just gonna cash out because they were not making any money and they were just gonna try and do this last game for the Nintendo the, the, the NES and just. Like try and have it be, you know, like one last thing on, on a new console for mm-hmm. them because they were used to PC gaming at this point in time. So, and then, and then they made a game that where half of the mechanics didn't work at all. Yeah, and they still made a truckload on it. Yeah, like 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 wheel up wheel up the wheel up the the garbage can or the the garbage like tr- truck and just like dumpster all this money on them and like mm-hmm. oh like, and like i oh, love this, final this, fantasy one but if this, you just take a look at all of the stuff that just none of these mechanics worked they yeah. they're in the game they just don't do anything yeah so like <laughs> and 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 yeah and but again it was just the the initial gameplay of just like uh, there's a, there's a story here that that's being told as rudimentary as it is but no one had really thought about like oh we can have there be stories in our gameplay. It just can't be. Are you a bad enough dude to go rescue the president? Absolutely, I did. The game had strong story and strong aesthetics for the time. Yeah. It and I think those two things combined made us forgive a lot of a lot of the flaws of the game. Yeah, and and, and, to, and to bring us back on the topic, this experimentation is a lot easier to do when you're only spending a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a game. I think, that, it, I think that I think that ties directly into the current indie revolution where yeah. now you have another like I've heard developers from the NES era speaking back on the era saying it was it was like the wild west of video games. Yeah, it, it was because you could get away with almost literally anything and it didn't really cost you too much because like there was no regulation really. You could and in the indie game era we're in now i think it's that it's a second era of that i mean hell i was just i was just watching somebody play a game about fish that fought that shot lasers and missiles like they were in macross this still sounds like an nes game it literally sounds like an an nes NES game game. it's like oh you're a fish and you shoot lasers sure that makes sense because you're a because you're a space fish yeah sure fine like like that's totally something you would see in the nes era and the indie game, it, the indie game side of it's bringing that kind of stuff back. Yeah, like um, there, there's a game I, I was watching on a, a person on Twitch play, where it's literally made by one guy, and he made this like this like gladiator game where you're like you're uh, you're the owner of a bunch of slaves in ancient Rome, and you gotta send your gladiators out to to fight and earn you money and earn respect and power, and it's just like this this really complex game. Only it's eight bit graphics. Like this thing looks like it could have been on the on the uh, NES, and it looks fantastic and it plays really solidly. And it's made by literally one guy. Well, the same thing. Undertale was made ninety ninety five percent. It was made by one guy. He had two he had two friends who were artists that did a little of the artwork, but he did ninety percent of it. He did all of the programming. Yeah. And he did most of the music. I think somebody did one or two songs for him but like that game would have happened if he, if he didn't have those people helping yeah I, and, and it's just and that's part of the, and that's part of the thing you could get away with back in the nes and snes era is you could have these really small peak companies or these really small um uh gr- big people basically programmers and game developers to to do it like you could have these 10 to 10 to 30 to 40 studios Sure, it might take more time because obviously 1993 technology is not nearly as good as 2017 technology, but like you could still, most of the things that are being made today that are for the indie game revolution and then the, 
the nostalgia boom could be made with enough time and effort uh, with 1993 technology. So, all right. So then, then here's a question: With this current indie revolution, in which they are basically taking older style gameplay and sort of reinventing it, giving it new life, why do we look at that and and that becomes more forgivable than, say, a triple A developer that is shoveling out sequel after sequel after sequel and making bank doing it. Because the AAA companies have the money, and they should be, being the ones that have the money, they should be driving forward the innovation. Because, because, basically, again, like, I'm trying to drive this home, they have the money. They did the hard work to begin with way back when, in the NES and SNES and PS1 era, with their initial innovations and their initial ideas, they should be continuing to evolve and evolve the gameplay and innovate upon it because they have the resources and funding to do so. They shouldn't be banking on just sticking with the old formulas and sticking with the old style of gameplay. I... And, and, I, and, and I, I think we're starting to see some of them innovating a bit, although it'd be more so like individual game developers and game directors experimenting on their own with the not just like any 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 technology but also with the um advent of uh virtual reality well like nostalgia and innovation aren't mutually exclusive and right i think the comfort of nostalgia can ease the discomfort in innovation to give you you mario has often brought innovation when new consoles have come mario uh Super Mario World and Super Mario 64 both brought innovations at the time that later games picked up and used. I mean, 3D 3D roaming games basically were defined by Mario for by Mario 64 for years. But how much of that innovation would have been how many people would have picked up a game with that innovation? if it wasn't Mario at the time to get them used to it for other games to build on. And that's, that's the, where the question of risk comes in. Because if you're going back to Ron's point, if the AAA developers are the ones that are supposed to be the, the drivers of innovation and new franchises, it's very clear that they're not, you know, we, we go back to the, the, to the Atlantic article, um, it mentions that Overwatch, which was made by Blizzard, it's their first game that isn't based on StarCraft, Warcraft, or Diablo since 1997. That's actually incorrect. There was also a Lost Viking since then, but I, I, I get the meaning. And it, it mentioned that uh, Nintendo's Splatoon was their first new IP in 14 years. Has it been that long since Pikmin? It has been that long, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. That was GameCube. <laughs> yeah. So, we if if these big AAA titles are supposed to be the, the drivers and the, and the movers of new innovations, new franchises, new IPs, because they have the resources and the cash to do it, it's very obvious that they're not. Well, here's the thing. Um, I, okay, I'm going to... I'm going to reference a concept for this, and then I'm going to go where I was going. All right. Um, I think of games as having several dials or meters that re that measure your enjoyment. Story, gameplay, aesthetics, challenge, all, of, all games have a different variable amount of these things to attract different gamers, things that you enjoy. Does that make sense to everybody before I go on? Like, that's... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Games that references old, that reference older games or styles have another meter for nostalgia, and that can be another thing that people enjoy, and it doesn't have to detract from any of the others. The problem is when people lean on that nostalgia to the point that they tr don't try to deliver on anything else. Like that's where the issues come from. I would say, for games like Splatoon, or like Overwatch, 
they actually leaned on nostalgia without having the a name associated with it. I mean, Overwatch heavily leans on people's familiar familiarity with Team Fortress 2 in styles of games like that. It's like not the, it's not the Team Fortress 2 is also just the general MMO mentality because of the roles that they have assigned for, for the characters for the for the 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 the, the gunners or the fighters of the I, in Overwatch. Like, sure, they do different things. Like, Diva's a tank, and she's this, like, mech pilot, for, and Reinhardt's a tank, but he's not piloting a mech. He's just a dude with really heavy armor and has a has a plasma shield. Yeah, so and they... a really big hammer. But, like, but they, they both fill the, the tank MMO role of sitting in the front line absorbing a bunch of damage and not dying. Yeah, so that there's definitely gameplay nostalgia there, of the comfort of coming in and having an idea of what to expect playing the game and coming from and uh for splatoon splatoon definitely has an aesthetic that people are going for it's freaking old school nickelodeon back when they still had the gap oh oh yes i i'm yes. Not, i'm not saying that these AAA developers should be creating new ips in a vacuum i mean all art takes its inspiration from the past at, in some form Oh, absolutely, and I'm and I'm just pointing out that these have nostalgia in different forms, and they use that to make people more comfortable with the innovations they brought into these games. Like Splatoon was not a typical first-person shooter. You're trying to cover the ground, not kill the other players. But they did certain things to make you more comfortable with it, and that's the best way to use nostalgia. And the best sequel ones are ones that go, well, this is Resident Evil. You know the you know what to expect from Resident Evil, but this is gonna be Resident Evil 4. We're gonna do all these things that are gonna be different, but you're gonna give it a chance because it's a Resident Evil, and then you're gonna love it. Like, that's the kind of thing where you go, either use nostalgia in gameplay and aesthetics, like Splatoon or uh, Overwatch to make people more comfortable with the game to, to make them buy into a new IP or take an old IP and use it to make innovative ideas like a lot of the Marios have done, like Zelda's done, like sev like most successful franchises have reinvented themselves at least a few times. They have to, you know, in order to in order to stay relevant. I mean, and then you see franchises that don't, and reviewers do hit them for that. Uh, to Just a, two of them that are coming to mind. Um, Halo and Silent Hill. You know, each successive game in that franchise, that, those are examples where they really haven't sort of reinvented themselves. And as a result, you know, on the professional reviewer's side, you know, they'll praise the game for its story or whatnot, but they they make it known that it's still the same gameplay, it's still... everything's the same, there's been no changes made from the start of the franchise to now. Yeah. And because it has the Halo name slapped onto it, or the Silent Hill name slapped onto it, it's gonna it's gonna print money for them. Well, that's why, you know, after people being a nerd with Silent Hill for so long, that's why Silent Hills blew up so big. Because people were going, this is what we want! This is what we've been waiting for! And then, it and then Konami said, fuck off, never mind. Yeah, and then Konami said, consoles? <laughs> <laughs> what are those? Pachinko machines and mobile, that's the future. And, and, and to go back to, to your original que question, Brian, of why are the AAA studios not doing it? Uh, the simplest answer I have is because humans are greedy and capitalism is the ruling ruling like body uh, right now. I would actually go in a different direction than that. It definitely comes down to money, but here's the thing. Every video game studio right now, with the exception of Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. So I'm talking third party here. Not talking first party, because yep. they are big enough companies. But 
every single other company, even the ones like Capcom and Konami, are one big failure from being in danger, and most of the companies are one failure from being out of business entirely. And that's why you see so few risks, because they can't afford at all with the co- with how much it costs to make a modern AAA game to have that failure. They, they can't. If they do, they're not going to be around anymore. And I guess that was kind of the, the point I was going to try and make was to expand upon my capitalism money idea was like, it, it ain't cheap to make games. Like, I mean, we saw Final Fantasy XV is in development hell for Square Enix for 10, 15 years almost. And, like, they were relying on having their, like, nostalgia keep them afloat. And they blew through almost all of their nostalgic capital, basically, just trying to keep themselves afloat while they were working on Final yeah. Fantasy 15. And, and, fi- and if 15 had ended, that was they, they said that was going to be the end for the Final Fantasy franchise. Yeah. And, like, I, I, I don't know the sales numbers for 15 at the top of my head. I, do, I mean, maybe check the, go back and check the recording that we did on it. But, like, I Excellent. think it did pretty well. I, it, I, did, I, it, it is, they, they've stated, it is a resounding success for them. Yeah, because, well, look, here here's an example of a AAA company that uses nostalgia for its, for its benefit. Sure, it took them 10 years to make it and go pay, pay dividends on it. But they use the, the nostalgia power of Final Fantasy 15 or of the Final Fantasy franchise to to innovate. Like the gameplay is pretty innovative compared to most anything else in like the, that genre, um, and the story is solid. I mean, it's familiar, but it's 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 still a good story. So they 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 use their nostalgia to keep themselves afloat and then use the nostalgia in the game to to innovate. drive home to, to innovate so like sure it took them 10 years to do it but finally someone did it well if we're and but by the way I agree wholeheartedly I think Final Fantasy 15 was a great example of innovation but if we're going to talk nostalgia and games that are that are thriving off of nostalgia especially Squaresoft we got to talk about Kingdom Hearts because that oh that God. that franchise isn't just living off of nostalgia from one game. They got to bring a whole nother company in. They're feeding off yeah. of nostalgia from all sides. Yeah. So like, not only yes. Yeah, so, so for Kingdom Hearts specifically, not only do they have the entire breadth of the library of Final Fantasy to work with, which is like eh, 20, 30 years, like pretty much the entire length of the the modern day video game like life cycle, which is a pretty which is a relatively long life cycle. They have the entire library of Disney. They can literally go back to 1920 or 1930 and grab freaking Snow White and her dopey dopey ass dwarves. And, and now they have the now they have the ability to use Star Wars if they chose as well. Uh, they also have the ability to use Marvel. So you now have we don't we in. don't know that yet. we don't know that yet. Oh, they could Disney owns seen. Marvel, but they've had an interview where they where they were asked do you have the ability to use them? And they went, we haven't gotten the okay to use Marvel yet, but we've gotten the okay to use Star Wars if we choose to. Yeah, but mind you, the last I read, like, this was like three years ago when they were asked, can we use Marvel? So I, that, that's three years from last, from Absolutely. when I last remember. They, they're going to have access to all of the franchises ever by the end of Kingdom Hearts. Yeah, like, like, like and the end of Kingdom Hearts will be Kingdom Hearts 4, but it'll be out in 20 years. Yeah, Longer. like, or, yeah, it'll be 2070 when it comes out. <laughs> but, but, like, like I mean, here's a, here's an example of a game that's, like, using its nostalgia in, in, it's in this really weird, like, you got peanut butter in my chocolate, you got chocolate in my peanut butter sort of thing. Absolutely. Um... As, sorry for bringing up Kingdom Hearts. I didn't want to bog the thing down with it, but I thought I think any any real discussion of nostalgia has got to bring that up. But uh, I, I've lost all my faith and desire for Kingdom Hearts because they keep shoveling out uh, 
Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 and the various filler games in you know for every platform in existence and I'm just like all right waiting yeah I mean, waiting I mean to be fair we've been waiting for Kingdom Hearts 3 about as long as we've been waiting for Final Fantasy 15 so oh yeah and just to go back uh Final Fantasy 15 has sold over uh 5 million units yeah, yeah, that's, um... Mm -hmm. It was the fastest-selling Final Fantasy game in history. Yep. So, assuming assuming $60, because I think that's what the full price was for the game, that's $300 million USD. Yep. Which, uh... Yeah, that's a lot of money, even for, like, EA, or... Well, considering or, how much it costs to make the game, they, they definitely made made their money back by quite a bit. Yeah. But I'm, I mean like to be I, I would argue it probably cost them 150 200 million so they definitely made some money back but they probably had to have that many sales just to break even which Yeah, that's that's the point I was going to make is like let's say it, let's say it cost them 150 so they made an extra 100 million. Yeah. Well, there if it cost them 200 to make that one game, that means they didn't even make enough to fully cover another uh, another extra game yeah and that's but, what i mean by hmm? yeah and i get you and that's you know, what and it's what you mean by the the cost of making a game now yeah. triple like game nowadays but but part of the the cost in 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 in, in 15 was they had to reinvent their graphics engine like five times over so like that's 10 million dollars probably yeah. of investment and in, and in expense experimentation and technology development that got flushed on the toilet three or four times before they finally decided on this. That's th one thing I've heard that the Japanese game market is moving away from. Because American developers will just keep using the same engine for several games. And, yeah, and case, I mean, in, case, in, case in point, Bioware and Mass Effect. Holy shit. Yep. What the hell? Absolutely. This game looks like it belongs on the PS3. Why but, is this on the PS4? But, like, in, in America, usually the developer will make a new engine when a new system comes out. Yeah. And then they'll use it through the system's lifespan. And a lot of times they'll license it out to other smaller companies to use. Yeah, like, uh, the Unreal Engine is yeah. the, like the best example of this. Like, here's an engine that's made by a group of people, and then they just, like license it out and it's not even that expensive to license out they make their money by how many people like they license to and they yep. get a cut on the profit and like in japan the companies there have traditionally done a new engine with basically every game that unless seems such a waste of money to me it, it like, is and it's something that they're moving away from as they're trying to reduce the costs of making games that's good because i mean you should have been doing that in 2002, you doofuses. <laughs> but like, well, it, but, it is part of why, like, a lot of Japanese titles innovated in graphics and aesthetics because they pushed the boundaries because they made a new engine every game, so every time they could push it a little farther. Meanwhile, yeah. you know, American companies like they might they they innovate for one game a generation when it comes to that. And then the rest of their games run off of that. Yeah, but like, if you could tell me, like, if you told me Square Enix could now make, I don't know, three other, like, I don't, I don't want to say triple A, but like double A or single A, like, like some some really good good quality games with the same graphics engine that they use for fifteen, I'd be like, sure, fantastic, sounds great. You solve the graphics problem immediately. And it costs you almost nothing to to mm -hmm. like inve in, to invest in. You now have ten million dollars or twenty million dollars you can spend on innovation. You can spend it on gameplay evolution. You can spend it on you, I don't know better voice acting if you want to have better voice acting or better motion capture technology or something like that. Like you have this, you now have this money that you could use now that you've developed this engine. And you can just use this engine as the the backbone to carry you throughout all of the PS4, and arguably probably even the PS, the eventual PS5, because I don't know about you, 
Final Fantasy 15 is a pretty, very pretty game, and I, and even I think on like a 2K or 4K TV it would look very nice. We're getting to the point of diminishing returns when it comes to graphics. It's not that there aren't ways to make things look better, but at this point you are getting far less return on your investment than you did in the past. Um, uh, most of what's going on in graphics right now are taking the same amount of uh, the same quality and instead reducing the overhead of how much it takes for the system to run it. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, yeah we're getting we're basically getting, optimization versus I- improvement, basically. Mm. Exactly. And we're getting to the point where uh, I think we're going to see game engines last a lot longer because it's a lot less necessary to continue the innovation when it comes to the to the engines and that money could be used elsewhere whether it's going to be used to improve other things in the game or whether it's money they can put aside to fund another game that is the ideal but i i get the sneaking suspicion that we're just going to see another port of final fantasy 4 just for a quick easy a quick shot in the arm I think we're going to see, well, like I said earlier, I think we're going to see way more ports as things go along all digitally. I think once, like, why not just take your library and dump it onto the new, the new digital game, the new uh, digital system for Xbox or PS3 or PS4, Project Scorpio. uh, What's the new PS4 one going to be called? The The PS4 PS4 Pro. Pro, Pro, thank you. Yeah. I was actually going to call it Deluxe. (laughs) <laughs> Pro's not much better, but um, like, why why not just dump your library onto? I mean, who do, who does it hurt to make it available for people? I don't know. It, it's just I, it, for for right now, it's a rather interesting time in in video gaming because there's this now weird weird this weird like crossroads of do we work on optimization or do we work on VR technology because that could be what the people want to work on. It, it's in, oh. it's in, it's entirely possible. I mean, that's that's more and more developers are taking up that slack or trying to trying to actually give a practical application to VR. They've only been trying for the last thirty years, but you know, these things take yeah. time. I, I I'll be honest. I'm going to be very selfish here and say that I hope. VR doesn't take off to become the new big thing because it doesn't like I, I my eyes don't work correctly and I can't do VR well mm. so it's not my my, I, my eyes don't form one image in my brain I'm either looking out of one eye or the other so VR for me is not a pleasant experience mm. So what you're saying is, what you're saying is, you need the Matrix tentacle going up into your brain. Yeah, to, to directly like interface me into it. A- absolutely. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. well, yes, yeah. of course. But we're not there. Yeah. <laughs> G- give it like five more years. Last thing I want to touch on before we end the first half, um, you know, steering the conversation back. You know, you have. You know, back to the nostalgia thing, when developers are taking an older game and they're remaking it, uh, I will use, I mean, we've seen companies use this to great success, like the Resident Evil 1 remake, you know, the jump, you know, for the ori- taking the original PlayStation 1 game and making incredible upgrades and improvements to it in all aspects of the game. When it and then it came out on GameCube, and I thought that Capcom did a wonderful, wonderful job with that. Then you take some. Then you take something that Square did, and that they they polished up Final Fantasy V, for example. Polish is a really, really loose term. Yeah, yeah loose term for that. Like I mean, I, I in some I would argue they actually worsened it. Well, I, would, thing- I would absolutely support your argument. Well, because- well, 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 let me finish the thought before before you shit on, on, the, okay, on the remake. Sorry, um, sorry. <laughs> hold that rage. Um, then, you know, obviously they bungled that because 
you had first they built the hype that hey Final Fantasy V we're we're remaking it, and then it got released and the risk that they took came to fruition when the fans of the original five responded with this is shit. So yeah. so here you had Square trying to make a quick buck in theory by remaking a very loved entry in the classic Final Fantasy series and it got very very poorly received well after what they did for Final Fantasy 4 like people were hoping that they were going to be doing a full remake mastering of the game and that's not what they got and I think I think they had set the the company had set expectations so high because of what they'd done for previous games that when they did this one that felt more than a little half assed, probably full assed, um, the fans basically were acted out far more than I think they would have if they hadn't gotten such good remakes recently. Yeah. Just I agreeing and, and stopping there because like, we've, we've been talking for an hour and <laughs> I, I, I think we could all take a, a few minutes to breathe and relax <laughs> for a moment before before we continue the vitriol. Ron, that is that is not how we beat the Final Fantasy VII podcast's record. Please, I was on that podcast. I don't want to beat that record. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. That's, you know, talk about tapping in nostalgia. I mean, very briefly, you know, Square is remaking Final Fantasy VII. That's not going to be released for another 90 years. Now, we already have, for all the joy that Final Fantasy brought to longtime fans of Final Fantasy and all the fans that were brought into Final Fantasy because of VII, the game is not even out yet, and there's already a pretty sizable uh, you know annoyance and anger from fans of Final Fantasy 7 that it is not a shot for shot remake of the original because a shot for shot remake of Final Fantasy 7 would be fucking terrible it'd be terrible it, and they, they, I, don't know I what they don't know what they want they're I, idiots they're, it's, it's not that they don't it's they're not, Luddites they don't know what they want they don't deserve <laughs> this it's not I don't think it's that they don't know what they want it's that until the game's in their hands and they can play it, they're letting their... They, most people remember things either because it was a very positive or very negative experience, but they lose any negativity that was in that positive or positivity that was in that negative. So they're remembering how good 7 was without remembering the bad things about it, but also they're going, well, what was, the, what was that remake that I really hated that came out recently? And then they go, yeah, that wasn't like the other one at all. That, so at, Final Fantasy VII is going to be terrible. I mean, look at that. They, they can't do remakes, right? Like, people are, until they actually have it in their hands to play it and judge it on its own, they're basically letting their fears run them. To be fair, most of the remakes that have come out from Square Enix aren't actually made by them. It's some other third party that they've just given the licensing rights to to, to give them the remaking. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, you're like, correct. And it's and it's only Final Fantasy VII, I think, that's actually being remade by them. Like everything else has been licensed out to some other. Yeah. Party. Final, as I say, Final Fantasy IV was done by an outside company. I know that uh, the Final Fantasy III was done by an outside company. Final Fantasy V was done by an outside company. I think I think the Game Boy Advance ports were done by an outside company. Yeah. So you know, um, here you have here you have Square very very obviously trying to tap into the fondness and nostalgia for Seven, but you know already we we have this this sort of and you're right it's 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 the it's the fear and the emotional that that's taking charge well, here if it was if if what we'd seen so far had been a shot for shot remake people would be complaining that there's no innovation there that it's just the same <laughs> thing we've always seen like right now you're at the point where there's going to be complaints regardless because people are going off of their fear and that's something like the companies just know that. Um, 
it, it, the same thing happened with Final Fantasy 15. Take a look at some of the negative stuff that came out on that whenever we got information on it. Like, there, there were positives, but there were also people writing negative articles. And, like, that just, that's gonna happen. Like, and, and to go back to it, like, people want ATV and they want static battlefields and things like that. No, you're idiots. That's a terrible idea. You're, no, just it's just bad. It, they used those back then because they didn't have the freaking capabilities to, to render in the battlefield of, of well, your Ron, surroundings. Ron, you're, you're dead to me now. Uh-huh. Yeah. You're dead to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> and on uh, that note... <laughs> just, yeah, hang on. R- Ronnie and I need to have a clash of Ron's conscience here and <laughs> see which one's going to come out on Squib- top. We, we will play a, a rousing game of Smash Brothers, and we will be back with the victor. <laughs> Somebody is going to die. <laughs> Virtually, not in real life. Both, so. runs, both runs enter. One Ron leaves. <laughs> <laughs> with that, we will cut to break. You are listening to downloadable content. Which Ron comes out on the second half? Listen and find out. We'll be back. Welcome back to Downloadable Content, talking about nostalgia, good and bad. Um, I regret to inform you guys that both Rons actually killed each other during the intermission, so it's just going to be me talking to myself for the next hour. I mean, just we'll have a moment of silence for those two as they 
they blew themselves up and probably took a good chunk of the planet with them. They super saiyan their way and it's just, it, it was terrible. There's, there's nothing left. We, we, we lost. We lost. Oh, there's a Ronnie. <laughs> I, I made it out alive. I, I don't know about Ron. I don't know. I don't know where he is now. Maybe a better place. He survived! We have each other. How would you like to spend the rest of eternity with just each other? <laughs> well, it looks like we have, a new, we have a podcast to get back to. Oh, right, 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 podcast, right, right, right. Right, right, right. I forgot yeah, something. Right. Wizard did it, right. right. Yes. Um, anyway. Anyway, yes, nostalgia, yes. Mm, good, good. <laughs> I, you know... I'm already feeling very nostalgic for that hour that we did earlier today. You know, I'm, <laughs> I don't know if we're ever going to be able to match that with, I mean, we may as well just call this a remake right now. Or miss the good times, shitting on Konami, you know, just I the, know, the bread like, and butters, man. Bread this, and if, butters. We talk, if, if we talk about Konami now, it's just going to be a throwback to what we did earlier. I know. We'll call this we'll call this DLC remastered because that's yeah. another uh, another. We, we may as well we may as well not even do. It. We may as well just end now, Ryan. Fine, we'll throw in the towel. <laughs> I'll just slap a remastered sticker on this, charge full price, and uh, watch the money just pour in. Hey, at least we at least we tried to make new content. Can't say the same thing about Capcom. Oh, zing! <laughs> I, I uh, shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> All right. I don't know. I mean, Cap Capcom has. I have a love hate relationship with Capcom when it comes to this kind of stuff because when they do something new, it's generally good. Yeah, they just don't want to do anything new, <laughs> <laughs> like pulling teeth. Yeah, I like I like. I mean, the last new thing they did was probably make freaking um, Resident Evil Seven. Pro- like, yeah, no, that definitely would have been before that, it. I would have said uh, Street Fighter Five. Yeah, but Street Fighter Five didn't even really do many things new. Okay, if I anything, if anything, if anything, it took a step back with like required eight frame delay and like that's not even like a hard hardware limit. That's just Capcom being douchebags, thinking no one can input input directions that fast for the okay. reaction time. Well, I, I uh, noticed coming from the not fighting guy game person, I've heard very positive things about Street Fighter Five, and I actually do own it. Um, uh. Well, to start off this second half, because I know I know that you know while we could spend hours and hours shitting on Capcom, I think we have actually. That's actually <laughs> a <laughs> whole another podcast that was already done. A few of them. Possibly. Probably at this point in time. <laughs> so, we talked about in the first half that one of the biggest reasons why AAA developers are hesitant to begin or, or invest in new franchises, new IPs, this whole idea of risk aversion, because, Ronnie, as you mentioned, that a lot of these companies are one major failure away from just going bankrupt. Yeah. So, the the Atlantic article that I mentioned in the first half argues that it's because of this, because of this risk aversion, that this is an a very likely unsustainable trend. Because, and now I'm quoting, uh, it says, What happens when the next generation of gamers without a fondness for Metal Gear Solid ages up, but has no desire to drop 60 bucks on the latest incarnation when they can pay less than 5 bucks for a fun smartphone game? Analysts and industry leaders continue to argue that the future of gaming is in mobile, with kids growing up with tablets instead of TVs as their main entertainment platform. Dedicated game consoles will see their share of the market shrink. I think there's a couple different ideas in there that they're putting together that don't belong together. All right. They're putting nostalgia and consoles together with the concept of the what people feel a game is worth reducing, where people who 
were raised where games can be $5 and you get them on mobile and you get them on Steam, not being willing to pay $60 for a game. Um, and I think that is an entirely different thing than the concept of nostalgia getting you to buy a game. Because you want to know what? They're going to, let's talk about the younger generation right now. They're going to have nostalgia for Minecraft. They're going to have nostalgia for some of the stuff they're going to play on mobile or Steam. And you want to know what people are going to cash in on that later. It doesn't matter whether you're cashing in for $5 or $50. You're still cashing in on nostalgia. What they're saying is the current nostalgia isn't going to be relevant for the younger people. And I actually wholeheartedly disagree with that. And I think anybody who does any company who does any research is going to see that because I'm going to use an example here of soap operas. You want to know how soap operas live so long? Because children watch soap operas with their parents, generally their mothers, and were brought into it in that way. And then they got a love for it and continued watching it. And that's how they last 50 years. Pro wrestling worked the same way um, for the, for, for at that point, like people watching it generally with their fathers who would be brought into this, who would grow up with it, who would then show it to their children. Right now, I have friends with kids who are raising them on video games, both modern ones and older ones. And you want to know what? Those kids are going to have nostalgia for those things. Like kids don't pop out of nowhere and not have a frame of reference most of their frame of reference are going to be their, from their parents. And now that parents are gamers, by and large, you're going to get that. When we were kids, we didn't have that. We came out of, we came because gaming was new. And because gaming was new, we had to figure it out ourselves. Brian, if you, if you had a kid, you'd be showing them the games that you love, both the new and the old, and they would grow up on that. And they would discover their own too. Like, they would find things that they loved separate, but that's going to give them their baseline of what of what it is. Like and, it's not like they're going to not have nostalgia. And I already have. I mean, uh, uh, two of my nephews, uh, I ha introduced them to video games by way of a obscure little number called Shovel Knight, and mm -hmm. you know, they love Shovel Knight. They can't get past the second or third level, but they love Shovel Knight. Hey, I couldn't get past the uh, the water stage in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I still remember that game fondly from when I was a kid. So there is something to be said for that, and I, and I do think that when I read this article, when I when I got to this that particular paragraph, you know, that's what you know. I was sort of thinking along the same lines as you. It was like, okay, yes, the franchises we know and love are eventually going to peter out. You know, or I, they'll or they'll reinvent themselves. Well, I mean, I mean. Yes, I mean Final Fantasy's done it. <laughs> you know, yeah. thirty years later. I mean, we. I mean, we'll we'll introduce them, and as long as good games keep coming out in franchises, new people are going to discover them. Parents are going to show them to their kids, and they'll and they'll continue. Now, if a fran franchises are eventually, some franchises are eventually going to end either because the company can't produce worthwhile games for them, or the companies abandon them altogether. Konami. But, um, like, other than that, like, I don't see, like, fr they're not going to inevitably end unless we let them end. And that's not necessarily always going to happen. I mean, do you ever see Mario going away unless Nintendo goes out of business? Yeah, and Mario is, that is, that is the the final straw that if nintendo is going under but by mario that's just yeah well like the i mean the, this argument applies just as much just i know not, neither of you two agree but just going off the article this argument applies just as much to mickey mouse like he's been around forever but 50 years ago you could have made the argument that the only reason he's around is because of nostalgia and he's eventually going to go away i mean what what happens to people who didn't grow up with him that don't have nostalgia for him anymore? That didn't happen because people were introduced to them by their parents. People watched them. New generations keep getting introduced and keep falling in love with them because there's things to fall in love with. It's the same for video games. The cost thing, I think that's a different one that's completely separate from the nostalgia and I definitely think that's going to affect things going forward is 
people go, I don't need to spend sixty dollars on my game. We're already why, we're why? already seeing that now. Yeah, exactly. Like I mean, also consumers I think are smarter now because they will look at a game and go, okay, I feel like this game is worth. 20 30 40 50 dollars because of x y and z reasons and they don't want to spend 60 dollars on a triple a game unless they're already a fan of the franchise or they're going to get their money's worth out of it case in point like an rpg or uh like even a, i guess even it's like some of the sports titles i guess you can get some really long replay value out of because of um like online playability yeah like like Breath of the Wild and Mario Kart for the Switch, those were the first games that I dropped sixty bucks on in years. I'd have to go back to Resident Evil Six when that launched as the last time I bought a game for that amount of money. And you know we are seeing that already. That you know especially in our own generation where. You know, our incomes might not, we might not have a whole lot of discretionary income. So if you're going to, pl- if we're going to plunk down 60 bucks for a game, it better be good. Yeah, absolutely. And like, but once again, like, this doesn't really have to do anything with the, with the nostalgia argument. Um, it was just separating that price argument from the article because they were conflating the younger generation not wanting to pay $60 for a game with the concept of nostalgia, which I, I don't think that connection it really exists. Like, the closest thing would be, if you have nostalgia, you might be willing to pay more for something than you would for something you have no connection to. And, and to a point, yes, that, that would be true. I mean, if Zelda Breath of the Wild wasn't a Zelda game, would you have spent sixty dollars on it? Mm, probably. Actually, no. I, I can say the answer being yes because something similar did get released around the same time as Breath of the Wild, called Skyrim? Horizon Zero Dawn. Oh, okay. Which is part and that parcel, might... pretty damn near close to Breath of the Wild. And that and uh, okay, so that the answer can be true and it can be yes, but I'm just saying. For a lot of people, do you think there are people who wouldn't have spent the money if it wasn't Zelda? Maybe. I would say I yes. Probably, I, I don't think they would have spent $50. Yeah. But that, that was just saying that, like, nostalgia can make you spend more money than you might have otherwise. Like, that, that is a legitimate thing. Mm. That's all I was getting at. Yeah, and... You know, and even then, because it's a Zelda title, you know, there's a risk for Nintendo needing to do the franchise justice. Well, yeah, they, they especially, not every Mario title innovates, um, but when they put out a new Mario for a new console, they always try to put a new spin on it, and they do the same thing for Zelda. Like, I think they're a great example of franchises that live off of nostalgia, but also go beyond nostalgia because they, they don't just do nothing else other than nostalgia. Like they, they do innovate. They do try new things. They do use that name to get you to give a chance to something you might not have given a chance to otherwise gameplay wise. Hmm. And, you know, I, I don't think I have to agree that the the idea of you know fran- our, our current franchises, you know what happens when they fade out, you know, and you have the next generation who don't have nostalgia for, you know, the current franchises. I agree, they're going to have nostalgia for the newer stuff. Well, I mean, this is already kind of happening. Like, okay, guys, we have franchises from the NES and Super Nintendo and Genesis and Master System era that don't exist anymore. But then we have franchises from those eras that continue to this day. You want to replace them? Halo wasn't from those eras. Uh, Uncharted wasn't from those eras. Like, we have new franchises that are continuing 
and old franchises that didn't that just stopped after three or four after three or four entries or some of them even more and then they just they didn't exist anymore why maybe the company went out of business maybe the later ones weren't as profitable but like it's not like they talk about this like it's never happened it happens all the time like if you take a look at the most popular franchises right now, most of them weren't from the original NES NES freaking uh, Master System era. A lot of them are modern. Halo, like, like I said, Halo, you can't say is that. Uh, Call of Duty, you can't say was that. Like, those were, I would call those from the generation after mine. That would be like the PS1 era, roughly. I mean, Halo's PC, technically, but like PS2, PS1... P- PS2 X- was kind of what I would I was thinking, yeah. but... like And like you can say for some of them, um, I mean, technically Metal Gear Solid was NES, technically, but although, okay, it didn't yes. really, although it didn't really take off until the PS1. Yeah. So, um... Trying to think of like some other like modern day titles that I mean, I, I mean to give to give an older one like the Adventure Island series had like seven games and Ooh. it ended. Alex Kidd had like ten games and it ended. Yeah, he got he got kicked to the curb by Sonic was what happened. Yeah, no, abs- no, absolutely. But I'm just saying like it's not like franchises in the past haven't ended and it's not like we haven't introduced new franchises that people have loved like nostalgia just keeps on circling and some some things never seem to go away and then some things are there for a while and then they leave and they're replaced by new things like that's that is just how nostalgia works yes very much so. And, you know, I'm just, I am just currently browsing a message board on GameSpot talking about this very, very topic. And it actually, it starts with a link to the article that we've been referencing. And there's, there's a lot of back and forth here. You know, there's some that, are agreeing with the idea that there's absolutely nothing wrong with making remakes of old games and appealing to nostalgia, and that the real problem lies in making remasters of less than three-year-old games because companies are lazy, afraid to take risks, and more than content to sell resell boring same old shit to gamers that are either dumb enough or have low enough standards to eat them up. Uh, I I think this is re- that's referencing The Last of Us. <laughs> Oh, pro- which we've already which we've already had that debate. Yep. And then you have some uh posts here that are basically they're just saying that games today aren't as good as the older games. And that is sort of the sort of the cranky kong uh line of reasoning. To well, me. I don't I think, know. I don't know if they're as good. I, I think they're good for different reasons. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people's, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use old games as like the SNES, NES. Yeah, era. yeah. They were like retro games are having a, are being brought back in a lot of ways, and I don't mean like sequels. I mean like retro style, like why Undertale is very similar to Earthbound or Shovel Knight takes from all of the platformers that have ever lived on the NES. Um, There was a simplicity to gaming back then in that mechanics didn't need to be as complex to have a really fun game. And there was a lot of purity of vision. The aesthetics were were very strong because you didn't have incredible graphics you couldn't see every plate of blade of grass so instead by using the different colors and the design work you could create a solid aesthetic and like these limitations forced people to grow their games and all of that combined made a very special time and i don't think it's necessarily always nostalgia that drives 
uh, people to make games similar to that. I think it is that style of game still appeals to people. There's a like Shovel Knight would have been a good game even if you gave it to somebody who had never played a video game before, who had never seen uh, DuckTales or Mega Man or Mario. That's just a good game. And there's a lot of them like that. I think the problem is people t- people see that style of game that we used to see back in the NES, SNES days and go, you're only making that for the nostalgia, you're only making that as a throwback, not going, well, what attracted us to these games in the first place? Like, is it bringing something to the table that Halo isn't? That Resident Evil isn't? Is it bringing something to the table that still attracts people? Because really, when you come down to it, video games are about entertainment. And you want to know what? There was a lot of entertaining things about those old games. And it might benefit the industry to take a look at that and try to remember why those games worked in the first place. Because we should always be moving forward. We should always be innovating. But there is an innovation in itself to taking and honing something that has been done and making it better. Which is what I feel that a lot of indie developers are trying to do. That was my soapbox. Good, and it was a good soapbox. Um, Because you you mentioned Shovel Knight. That's one of my all-time favorite games. My my love for Shovel Knight is just absolutely (laughs) stupid. It's... same. Well, I mean, mine's a little different, but like Undertale is one of my all time favorite games, and it's definitely drawing upon the nostalgia just as much as Shovel Knight is. And then you take games that, you know, are using the older mechanics, but presenting them in in a sort of newer way. Ori in the Blind Forest, which is it's a it's it probably considered a metroidvania style game and but it the way that the game presents itself with with a beautiful lush graphics a very very interesting story great music and gameplay mechanics you know i look at that game and i see you know something old being made new again ryan you're you're gonna want to slap me after i say this so I had a chance to play some games yesterday while Deja was at her parents' house, and uh, I was going to play Ori. And then, instead, I, I played Mighty Number no. 9. Ugh. Ah! Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. Wait, wait. Oh, it, um, let me eject you right out of the Skype chat. It ah. was Okay, wait, but this, this does tie into nostalgia. Um, yeah, I, I just... Oh, I feel I, like I, I need thought, a hazmat... I, <laughs> I backed Mighty Number no. 9. I was mm. one of the early people on it. I'm so sorry. Uh. It, I know, I know. And after it came out, I listened to the reviews and I read all the stuff and I went, I believe what they're saying, but I want to experience it myself, but I'm not going to until I have enough time in between all of since this to wash my palate clean and come into it with a clean viewpoint and see and see it for myself. So this was my first time playing the game since it came out. All right. Uh-huh. In a lot of ways, it wasn't as bad as people said. And then in other ways, it was so much worse. <laughs> like, uh, and it's not even like the, the game itself. Like the Sure, a, a, a new Mega Man-like game is fine. Like that's fine, but it, it feels like we literally just did get a, a, a slightly worse Mega Man. So, well, like they were trying, like let's let's put a couple things out here. We're gonna, using this as a, as a basis for this nostalgia stuff we've been talking about. They did try to innovate. They did do the whole dash to absorb people mechanic, which encourages you to go through the levels less strategically than in Mega Man where there are times where you would sit back watch to see the enemy patterns and then make actions and this had a different feel to it that tried to fo- that tried to force you to move through the levels faster to try to make more decisions on the run which 
lend itself to a different gameplay style, and that's not a bad thing. Um, the implementation of everything wasn't perfect, and the, like I said, there were quite a few flaws in the thing, but like, we can't say they didn't try to innovate, try to do something different. Like, they weren't just resting on their laurels. Yeah, like, they, they tried, and I don't blame them for trying, it's just... And I think it was a case of that they didn't have enough um, refinement on their innovation. Yes. Well, it's like my, what I said before from everything I'd read about it and from what I'll say now after actually playing it. I really hope that they're able to make a Mighty Number no. 9 too, because I think there's enough solid ideas in it that it could be a very good game if they it, like it, it honestly feels like the game didn't have long enough development like that's what it comes down to it, it, it almost feels, what? I, I, I agree which is surprising because it was delayed for how many months a year well, they, at least well yeah but they 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 drastically underestimated how long they were going to need to finish the, to do the game and honestly, it feels like it should have had another year behind it, and they could have had most of this stuff ironed out. Instead, they released something that couldn't live up to what they were trying to do, but it has enough good ideas that I feel like it shouldn't be thrown out wholesale. Yeah, that's fine. And I, I think I think if they do make a second one, I too also hope that they get time to work on their innovations and work on basically more quality control. Yeah, and yeah. like hopefully they can, uh, like get kind of take the, these ideas and refinements and work on them and and have there be a, an actual like solid gameplay to it. So, and I, and I, I, I think I don't know if he did another Kickstarter thing for it. If it would make as much, I would suspect that that it would probably. I think, if anything, he probably would just want to take some of the Kickstarter money that he started with and just use that to, um, to to yeah. to try and make it more I like think a, he's, a privacy. Privately. Yeah, I think he's going to have to find private investors for the next one. Yeah, like I, I I expect they will do a Kickstarter if if Red Ash goes over well, like if it actually comes out and does well, I could see them doing another Kickstarter. But regardless. I don't think they're going to shoot for as high an amount, and I think most of their money is probably going to come from private investing regardless, now that they have a track record as a company. For big, for good or worse. Mm. And, you know, the amount of money that they had brought in and the final product just... I mean, you, you take into account the fact that Capcom has basically abandoned Mega Man, and so you know, Me Mega Man was so, Capcom was so utterly convinced that no one wants to play Mega Man anymore. And... Well, here's the thing, Mega Man won. I, I okay, I, I'm probably gonna be crucified by both of you guys. But I'm a fan of the Mega Man franchise. Mega Man 1 was not the best Mega Man. Mega Man 1 needed num Mega Man 2 and 3 to refine things. I agree. Like, if Mega Man 1 was the only one in the franchise, we wouldn't be remembering it the way we are right now. I'm not saying Mighty No. 9 should be compared to Mega Man 1, because Mega Man 1 was definitely a more solid game. But I think the second game ironing things out is like we're we're going to remember more for that than anything else assuming a second one does come out mm. um but for other games like this i mean we have uh bloodstained which is going to be coming um which is not castlevania uh we have ukulele that just recently came out which i'd hope we talk about with nostalgia which is not banjo kazooie um I'm missing one. We have not Mega Man, Mighty Number no. Nine. We have not Banjo Kazooie. We have not Castlevania. What was the final not not one that they did? 
not ringing any bells at the moment. Okay. Well, we'll just go with those. I'm having a brain fart. But, I mean, ukulele came out and was exactly what it was promised on the tin. Did you guys have any experience with with that, whether it's from playing it or hearing about it? I know... I haven't really heard too much about it. I've heard... Like, it it is basically just the third Banjo-Kazooie game, so... It's... it, It is, like... The complaints that I've seen in reviews about it is it's too close to Banjo-Kazooie, to which I would reply, did you read the fucking Kickstarter? <laughs> did, you, did you read it? Did you? And then did you think about it and then read it again? Like, did you really think it over? <laughs> like, it was exactly what was promised. It is, the, it is a new Banjo-Kazooie. It's done just as good as the original with just as much love put into it, but it's not something else innovative. Like it has innovations. It has some new things in it, but when you get right down to it, like it is Banjo Kazooie. If you're attracted to that kind of 64 bit, uh, collectathon style game, you're going to love it. Mm. And I like they, they, gave what people said they wanted and then some people were complaining well yeah this is exactly what you said it was going to be but you don't we don't know what we want which you which you uh tapped into earlier brian yeah and and that that brings me to another sort of of point you know we we have kickstarter you know there is you know, for all of the the critics and people out there who think that nostalgia is bad for video games, you go on to Kickstarter and that point, that mindset kind of gets shot out the window. Because as... as Critic, wait, critics think that nostalgia is bad for video games. Some people think that nostalgia is bad for video games, but I would argue the majority of the video game playing populace thrives off of nostalgia. And I and I I tend to agree with that. And you know the peop you know we as gamers want to have enjoyable experiences and because we've had enjoyable experiences playing older games, we are willing to drop money to have those experiences again via Kickstarter, via crowdfunding. Well, here's, the, here's an argument I'll make. Uh, not, not an argument, but an observation. Brian, there's a little game called Castlevania Symphony of the Night. You've heard of it, correct? A tiny little number, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, did, it, did, it did reasonably well. Right now, us wanting a sequel to Castlevania Symphony of the Night which they're doing as Bloodstained, as not Castlevania, but if we wanted a sequel now, that would be called Nostalgia, correct? Yes. But if we wanted it two years after it was released, that's not Nostalgia. But if you've wanted a sequel since it came out, like, I think everyone was wanted a second Castlevania Symphony of the Night since it came out. At what point does that cross over from being a normal desire to being Nostalgia, and why? That's a good question. You know, how how long uh, uh, how long needs to pass? How much time needs to pass before we call it, we call it nostalgia? And I mean, an- another example. Notice we're never getting this, so I'm not even I'm not I'm not playing with your hearts for the viewers. But Mega Man Legends was a trilogy that never completed. It has an incomplete story. Is wanting a third version of that nostalgia, or Half Life Three? <laughs> yeah, well, that that's what I'm saying. Like, like what? Um, when we when you were gone, Ron, we were talking about a uh, Symphony of the Night. At what point after it came out does wanting a sequel for it cross over into nostalgia? Because right now, wanting it is nostalgia, and they made Bloodstained. But like a year or two years after it, that's a normal feeling. At yeah. what point does that cross out? I think for nostalgia purposes, when 
Yeah, in a rough sense, when a new console comes out, I guess would be my timeline. So, well, that, well, that would be like when sequels generally get done, though. Yeah, but like, gen- but what I, I guess to, to, to add on to it is when the world can ex- can benefit from more explanation or more um, exploration of it. Yep. Then it would, or or the story allows there for it to be a sequel or a tre- or a prequel or a trilogy or whatever, what have you. Like then that would be sequel. Whereas when an individual game has a self-contained story that is presented, and then you go through the entire game solving the story, then it would be nostalgia when you go back to revisit it so to kind of as an example of sequel versus nostalgia sequel would be like the bioshock trilogy like this is a world or a concept of like there's always a person there's always a there's always a tower and there's always a girl involved wait wait, are we talking about stephen king's dark tower trilogy Mm -hmm. No, 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 the the um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. When you go, there's always a tower. Like, yeah, no, but are you like about the dark tower. But like, I, I guess the the idea of like, there's always like these three core like tenets at play in, in the Bioshock series, and Ken Levine did a very good job of having the story focus on these individual characters. And then crafted this fantastical world around them. So for Bioshock One and Two, it was the world of uh, what was the world? What was the underwater city in Bioshock? Why is that Rapture? 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 Yeah, Rapture. And then you had uh, uh, Columbine, or, or no, it's um, Columbia. What was the Col- Columbine Infinite? is very different. Uh, yeah. you know, what, what, what was what was what was Inf- Infinite? Columbia. Columbia. Yeah. Yes. New yeah. Columbia. Yeah. The yeah. New Columbia. Like like these are all like worlds that are greatly removed from the the quote unquote modern like the quote unquote modern day, and they've had their own like evolutions and 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 societal breaks from back then, but there's still some things that you can refer to and see parallels to to other to the to the other games in, in the series that do callbacks to the rapture or like in the case of Bioshock 2 it's you go back to rapture 10 years later basically yep and then for Col- and then for infinite it's it's Elizabeth's portals that are breaking through time and going into alternate realities and one of the alternate realities she breaks into is is the world of Rapture, and that's how they get the plasma technology in 1910 and not 1940. Yep. Or 1950, I guess would be the, what it would be. But like, those all had like stories, and that those stories are generally self-contained. But there was enough of a world to explore that would allow for sequels to exist and then we eventually see the story culminate in Bioshock Infinite where the basically Elizabeth's power of like tearing through portals is of is just like alternate reality exploration and that there's an infinite number of alternate realities the whole idea of string theory and things like that and so that, that that's more so a sequel of even though these games could try and be feeding off of nostalgia to a certain point of the first Bioshock game, they all interconnected themselves in some fashion to have it become the trilogy. Yeah, the, the, thematic nostalgia. Yeah. There's there's thematic nostalgia, yeah, exactly. And that, Whereas with actual nostalgia, which would be more so of like looking to copy as much of the gameplay and story elements. Yeah. Well, and I think provide as little innovation as they could. When I, when I was saying the the different things that attract people, like you can have gameplay nostalgia, you could have uh, thematic nostalgia, you can have um, aesthetic nostalgia. Like these are all different. Co- like Shovel Knight has gameplay nostalgia. It's not the it's not the 
like it's not m- trying to be Mega Man. It's not trying to be this. But the gameplay brings up all of these different platformers um, in the way that it plays, and that's the nostalgia that it's bringing in. Um, you have aesthetic nostalgia for how for games that appear, that look like other ones, but they're trying to mimic that style. Uh, Bloodstained is obviously trying to be Castlevania, and you can see that in the aesthetics and the storyline. Um, storyline nostalgia, like every every aspect of why we enjoy games can have a nostalgia associated with it separate from everything else. And it's only when they try to do all of them at once and not do them well is it an, is it an issue. I talk too much. <laughs> fine. It's fine. When I get long winded, I, I take as much time as you, so. Yeah. Um, I, actually, I think a really good... I, I don't... I'm actually... As much as we've been trying to get Brian to play it eventually... Um, I don't think either of you two are familiar with this, but I think a really good example of a company using nostalgia would be uh, Oddworld, the Oddworld series, and Oddworld Inhabitants, the company that does it. Um, Are either of you two familiar, even passingly, with that franchise? I know of it. I haven't played any of the games for it, though. I I did make the first step. I did buy Oddworld New and Tasty on a Steam sale. So Deja wants to play that with you. You're going to do that the next time we visit. I I, I did purchase it, so I I have it. I haven't played it, but I do own it. (laughs) Okay. Well, the Oddworld games were originally meant to be a tetralogy. So, supposed to originally be five games that were all connected. And then they did, they only ended up doing four games, and only two of them were part of the tetralogy, and the other two were side stories. So, here's a game that had a overarching premise and story that they were trying to tell, and they were never able to do it. And they ended up, the franchise ended up. Uh, ending not because it didn't sell well but because of publisher interference um they dealt with two different publishers that really screwed them over and they ended up leaving the game industry for years Mm. then they came back and they did oddworld new and tasty which was a full remake of the original game um in the same style with some changes but Fully new graphics, new engine, new everything, um, and it did and it did amazing. And they're using that to fund a remake of the second game. And basically, what they're doing is they're making a little bit more every time, and they intend to develop to develop and continue the series by having funding the games this way. So they are literally using nostalgia to fund new entries in the franchise. And to redo the old ones for newer gamers. Okay. Um, I think this is a good example of a company using nostalgia appropriately. Yes, I would definitely agree there. It's it's not just some, you know, schlock job being like, hey, we know you're going to buy this because it makes you feel good. Yeah. Okay, that, that's all I had to say. All right. <laughs> I, I, I haven't played the game yet, so it's like I, 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 can't, okay. I, I can't add to that. So, And I, I tend to think that for all of the people who think that nostalgia is bad for video games, it's, it's very clear that the market is dictating otherwise. It may be not so much a good thing for triple a games because you know i do read reviews and i do notice that you know if a franchise goes for a long time and they keep putting out successive games and there's no real change to the style of game to the gameplay eventually reviewers and also gamers are going to eventually get sick of it but then you look at the indie scene and holy shit Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned... Un- Ind- indie gamers know what's up. Indie gamers know what's up. I mean, also, you know, let's face it, they are far more willing and adventurous than 
a AAA developer because usually indie devs don't have a board of shareholders to answer to. Well, I mean, you... you... Okay. I wish I could have... If I knew this is where the conversation was going to go, I wish I could have sent you a video from Extra Credits that relates to what I'm going to talk about, but they argued that one of the best directions that video games could go was to have the AAA developers basically do an indie game arm where they bring in indie game developers, give them money to fund their ideas, and give them the freedom to do those ideas for a share of the profits. Basically giving indie game, indie developers the money they need to fund their innovations, but in but for funding it, the company gets a cut of the profits, and depending on the agreement, probably the IP for the game. Mm. And that would allow us to see um, indie games you couldn't see done right now because there's only certain styles of game that you can do on that shoe strap of a budget. Yes. And this doesn't mean like triple A titles, but there there are limits. Like as much as we might want to say, you know, what what a single person, what a small team can do, like there are limits financially to what you can do if you don't have funding. Oh yes, of course. And uh, I see SquareSoft is already doing this to a point um, where they have their I forget exactly what it's called. Um, they they have a, a section of the thing where they where they're bringing in other games, allowing people to, to vote on them, and the ones that do well, um, they rather than give them money to fund the game baseline, um, they take over doing all of the marketing and doing all the stuff and getting it into stores. So um, kind of an I am Setsuna of, game. Yeah, kind, kind of an extension of Steam Greenlight. Yeah, yeah, th- th- basically it's that. Um, it's not quite what Extra Credits was talking about, but it's it's a step in that direction where they get the benefits of coming from a bigger name developer um, without having with, with they have the benefits of that without actually having to been developed by them and while Ayan Setsuna didn't quite do as well as everyone had hoped it, did, it definitely did not flop and they have several other games in the works like that Yes, and that that, that little uh, studio is called Tokyo RPG Factory. Yep. And Which has backing from Square Enix, I think? Yep. Yes, it does. That's what I was just talking about. <laughs> and, yeah, I just wish that that game was better. Okay, I, I, I still have to play it. That was one of the games I was considering playing yesterday. Um, but, like... Everything I've heard about it, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to have the same complaints about it that, that you did. Yeah, I mean, I, I played it and beat it, and I just I just wish it was th- there was potential there, but to me, it felt a bit lazy. You know, they build this game as being a, a spiritual successor to Chrono Trigger. And that immediately got my interest. I was like, hey! And uh, so I ended up getting the game and was kind of disappointed. I sort of felt that they used that that marketing as a gimmick with no actual substance behind it when it was all said and done. But you might have a much different take on the game than I do. So, you know, I will leave that discretion to you. Go ahead and play it, by all means. I just do not think it was worth the money I spent for it. To me, I Am Setsuna was an example of somebody trying to use the nostalgia flag as a marketing tool, and then that was all it had. To my great disappointment. Well, I mean, well, I, I I will personally see see when the time comes. So yes, but by all means, go ahead, play it. You have the game. Go ahead. So, alrighty. So just to to wind down on this topic and you know put this episode to bed. 
you know, it's it's clear that this is an issue that will be debated ad nauseum amongst gamers for ever, it seems. You know, there's always going to be a longing for you know the experiences that we grew up with, the the games that made us happy. Do we think that eventually the AAA developers are going to give us sort of these sort of newer ideas and new IPs again, or are they just going to, you know, keep digging in with their you know, sequel after sequel until they beat their cash cows to death? I personally feel like they've never stopped. Like, I could look up any company right now and tell you a game in the last two years that they came out with that was a new IP, and it may not have taken off, which that's the cost. That's part of why they do the nostalgia, is to tr- is to be able to pay for them taking risks on new IPs that might eventually become that. Um, but, I mean, there's there's a lot of them. I mean, I, I work in a Walmart. I see a lot of the games that come through in there. It's not all what people think of the problem is people see that because the nostalgia ones are the ones that get a lot of time in advertising because it's easy because they just need to let people know that it's there and then people are going to buy it all right ron um i do think they will have to start putting out some new intellectual properties soon by soon I mean probably within the next three years Um, otherwise there will be a a massive I don't say massive but a sizable drop in sales because the the companies continue pumping out these sequels year year after year and just can't or don't want to take that risk Um, I think we're starting to see people taking risks nowadays like we're having some companies like um like horizon zero dawn i mentioned earlier in the podcast and like that's a that's a brand new ip and it did fairly well in terms of like reviews and i think it sold like a million copies at least so it's it's a new ip and i think that that i mean it, there may be some sequels for it but i think that's because that the world that they've craft, crafted in the game would allow for it like allow for more games to be made in this this far flung post apocalyptic to, to to like neo human like humanity rebirth sort of thing they got going. Uh, I just don't know if I just don't know if this the companies will spend the time needed that they need to craft new stories and new gameplay, new innovations in, in game in the gaming medium. Or, or if they want to. All right. Fair enough. I mean, I, you know, and to, for, for me to close, I mean, I personally do not think that nostalgia is hurting the video game industry as a whole. I could, I can see where it might be a problem. I mean, as I've mentioned, I have my buying triple a titles has it's so few and far between that i now get most of my my joys out of indie games and so and you know anytime i see that a new ip is being developed by a triple a title i i will give it a look i will certainly give it a look like okay you have my attention it, it kind of makes me want to get a PS4 now that I see games like Horizon Zero Dawn. Like, hey, when is that coming to PC? Um, yeah. And so I, I don't think... I think nostalgia is is good, but I don't think that should be the only thing that should... I don't think that nostalgia should be the only factor for a game. So, that is my point on it. Anyone, any more final thoughts, or can we put this to bed? Um, I, I actually have just 
two two lines that I have left from my notepad file on this. We pretty much hit everything else. Um, I feel that nostalgia is generally a positive and important part of any growing medium. Uh, I think any medium that hits a certain age hits that point where nostalgia ends up becoming part of it. And I think that actually says it says a lot about video games as a whole that we're having this conversation right now. That we can talk about how whether nostalgia is hurting or helping the medium. Because that means video games have lasted long enough for that to really be for something we care about. for uh, That we have enough fond memories from the past that we were discussing this. Yeah. Like, like most people don't li- have not lived through... Like, this kind of debate happened for television back when it first showed up for film when it first showed up music too yeah music but art yeah but mo- for most of that uh, other than art because art continually reinvents itself and has this conversation every couple years but for the most part most generations don't live through that point where they can go well this didn't exist before and now it does and we can debate like there was a point when there was no video game nostalgia because video games didn't exist. And then we had these video games and they were so cool. And now we can look back on that. And the current generation, they're never going to feel that way because they've had video games their whole their whole lives. Video games were already established. They were able to enjoy established franchises. That nostalgia that that the nostalgia in the industry has was already there at that point. So the fact that we were able to have this conversation is a really cool thing. Yes. Um, the other line I was going to say um, is if video games are inherently about entertainment and enjoyment, which I think those are the two things that, that draw us all to video games, right? Yeah. And nostalgia can heighten your enter- the entertainment of a game, then inherently shouldn't that be something that they take advantage of, even if that's not the only thing they do? And that's a question that will continue to be debated in message boards everywhere. Well, like, well, like, uh, I'll ask you this, Brian. If we were able to surgically remove nostalgia from the gaming industry entirely, but leave the industry, the AAA industry, still here, releasing games that were entirely new, fresh, where every one of them people had to look at it fre- with fresh eyes. Do you think that would help the industry, or do you think the industry would probably collapse? I think it would. I think that would probably ultimately collapse because, I mean, like any art, you cannot make it in a vacuum. You need to have inspiration from somewhere else. Yeah, but even if we, even if I was taking away, even if I'm ignoring gameplay, uh, nostalgia, and that kind of stuff, even if I'm just referring to like if all of the sequels went away. And all the remakes went away, and it was all just original titles. Do you think the, do you think that that would imp- improve the industry, or do you think the industry wouldn't survive that? I don't think it would sur- survive for a very long time. I would agree with that. That would that was because again, there are stories and experiences that can and usually do go beyond one game i think at this point nostalgia is the backbone of the video game industry that allows everything else to spawn off of it and allows creative new ideas to happen because they have funding from the the nostalgic games or they can innovate because they're using this nostalgic this nostalgic title and world so we can try something new or we're using these nostalgic gameplay mechanics that you're familiar with and the aesthetic you're familiar with to introduce you to a new world that we could continue like i feel like nostalgia in all of these different forms is in many ways the unsung hero of the video game industry it's a demon that we make out to be evil when we wouldn't know what to do without it well, then, can you send that message to the AAA developers? I'd like to see at least a few more coming out of there. 
the indie game, the indie scene has has got this well and truly covered. But can can we can you send a memo to some of the larger developers saying, you know, nostalgia is good and all that, but you know, can you can you not go seventeen years without a new IP? <laughs> Most companies aren't Nintendo <laughs> or Blizzard. Both, yeah, okay. Blizzard and Blizzard and Nintendo because they are so so defined by their IPs. And even I, I would make the argument that they're wrong about Nintendo because I believe all the shit they did with Miis during the Wii era was basically a new IP. Okay. Where they were making all the games focused around Miis that you created and you did all these different things. I would argue that that was basically an IP. It just wasn't worded as such. Yeah, they're cute. <laughs> you know, if you like them. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying it was necessarily a good choice, but I'm just saying I would argue that that was as much of a new IP as anything else that's been done. Mm. Hell, their their name is... They're, they're, it was all called Me Whatever. Like, they even had the name in it. Yeah. Yeah, they did. <laughs> but I, I would I would argue, Brian, if you look up any one of the companies we've talked about that doesn't do a lot of new IPs, and you looked at what they've released in the last two years, I guarantee you would find a couple new IPs. They may not have done well, and that may be an issue, but I guarantee that they haven't done nothing except for the nostalgia trips. Fair enough. All right. Any more from you, Ron? No, I'm good. He's good. He's already he's he, he's already checked out. So, if any of you out there on the wide world of the internet have questions, comments, thoughts about this episode or any other episode of downloadable content, you can check us out on the website www.dlcpodcast.com. Feedback button in the top corner, top right corner. Let us know what you think. Download every single episode. See upcoming schedules. Let us. Uh, know if you want to be on a future episode it's all there and also as well every single episode can also be found on itunes youtube stitcher and google play music so all there for your listening enjoyment all 133 episodes thus far seven years of downloadable content all for your ears so all that remains for me to do is to thank ron and ronnie for being on this episode with me it Thank ma- you for putting up with me. Ah, you're very welcome. You know, I say Ron and Ronnie, and it just makes me th- makes you think that you want it's a comedy duo here. It's, it's Ron and Ronnie, or you know, or like Rod Roddy from The Price Is Right. You know, it's Ron Ronnie. I don't know. Whatever. My brain goes into weird places sometimes. So it does. It does. That, is, that would be a true statement. All right. On that note, everyone, I'm Brian. Have a good one, everybody. 